Morning and welcome to the Parisian Investment Management Interest Bearing Update. Today I've got Vishal Rama, the far left, he's a quantitative analyst in our bonds team. He's going to take us through uh, bonds and kind of the outlook that we see there. Bastian Tashkriba, our Chief Investment Officer, he's going to take us through the macro outlook um, and kind of our views from a prescient perspective. And then to my left, Henk Kotsa, who is Head of Cash and Income, who's going to talk us through the fund positioning and also the outlook in the, in the uh, fixed income space. My name is Ray Mere and I'm the Head of Retail. What a time to be alive. I think, gents, over the last few years, we've kind of used the term unprecedented quite a lot. Um, interest rates, all-time lows, um, you know, uh, negative real rates, and then now all of a sudden, interest rates, inflation is kind of pumping, interest rates and central banks are starting to increase uh, interest rates again, and again, still negative real rates. What's actually going on? Over the last few weeks, we've seen three 75 basis point hikes from the Fed, and other banks have followed suit. Uh, Basti, kind of what? what's, what's actually going on in the world? Today. Yeah, you summed it up quite nicely already, Ray. But first of all, um, thanks everybody for having us once again. Yes, um, 75 hike, 70, 75 basis point hikes three times in a row now. So that's what we've seen from the Fed. And the SOP didn't uh, take long to follow suit with two 75 basis point hikes. And that's not where it stops. So you can look across the globe, higher interest rates everywhere. We've got higher rates also in Europe with um, the ECB stepping away from their very, very long term zero interest rate or negative interest rate policy. And you can even go into emerging markets. Other developing countries have also raised rates. You can go to Australia, New Zealand, higher rates there too, or even into Scandinavia. So wherever you look across the globe, we are seeing higher rates. Okay, so it's, so it's not unique. It's not unique to South Africa, but from a, we're here to talk about fixed income. So what, is this, what do these higher rates mean for fixed income and South African fixed income in particular? Yeah, that's a good question because we often confuse um, higher rates and the Fed hiking with lower returns in fixed income. I mean, we've all learned um, prices up, uh, yields down, or other way around, yields up, prices down. So that is obviously holding true. But um, to be clear, a hiking cycle is not always necessarily extremely negative for bonds, especially if you look at the back end of the curve. So it's more like the surprises which matter. So. Um, when the Fed goes through a hiking cycle, often a lot of it is in the price. The question is how much. So we need to look this um, through, look at this through some charts, but let me show you in detail. Okay, so what we can show you quickly is basically um, one of the tools which we are using to track basically um, what, uh, what happens during a hiking cycle due to fixed income markets. So I'm going to start by looking into what we call our global central bank monitor. I'm going to drill in onto the Fed. So um, what we are showing in this chart is basically we see, we're going back all the way until the early 70s, until today, and then we're basically coloring in the hiking cycles in dark blue, and then we're moving into the cutting cycles in, yeah, I think this is light red, and then into periods of reasonably flat interest rates in light gray. So that in itself doesn't really tell us anything yet, but I just wanted to show you how we're going to split the sample. And what we can do now is we can now have a look and analyze how certain asset classes have performed during pe periods of the Federal Reserve hiking, the Federal Reserve cutting, or the Federal Reserve staying put. And given that this is a fixed income seminar, we're going to look into South African government bonds. So what we're showing in this chart is basically the all bond index and we have made it dependent on the hiking cycle in dark blue in the United States, the cutting cycle in the United States in red, or a period of flat um, interest rates in the United States, when we purely look into, um, into US interest rates. So as, as, as of just looking at this chart, it's very difficult to see any differences. But let's look um, under the hood a little bit more detailed. So we can look at the descriptive p statistics of our all bond index during period when the Federal Reserve was hiking, during a period when the Federal Reserve was cutting rates, and during a period when the Federal Reserve stayed put. And you can see that in the arithmetic mean, so the average return of the all bond index is only slightly lower than it is during a cutting cycle. Okay, so the mere fact that we are in a hiking cycle 
um, where the Federal Reserve is hiking doesn't really tell you too much. Actually, the return is interestingly higher than during a period where the Fed stays put. And even if you look at the bottom of the table into the standard deviations, there's actually less volatility in our all bond index, which is hard to believe if you look at recent observations. There's even less volatility during a period of hiking than there is during a period of interest rate cuts. So the mere fact that the Fed is hiking, that's not the problem. And I actually want to make it even clearer if I look to the return distributions um, of the all bond index during those three periods. So on the x-axis, we're showing the return, the monthly returns of the all bond index. And on the y-axis, we show the density. So how often are we seeing um, certain observations. I'm going to switch off the flat, um, the Fed staying on put. And I'm just comparing the distributions between a US hiking cycle against a US cutting cycle in red. And what you can really see is there's not too much of a difference. There's definitely room for all be out performance even during a Federal Reserve hiking cycle. So higher rates in itself are not necessarily the problem for the all bond index. Okay, so higher rates as a reaction to higher inflation globally. I get that, and maybe that's not news. That's how we always deal with inflation. But once again, we're seeing um, global sell-off and, and bonds and equities moving in the same direction. What does that mean for us here in South Africa? And in particular, what does that mean? We saw that in particular after the last inflation print here in South Africa as well. Yeah, before we go too much into South Africa, we're going to do that just now. I want to link it back to the States once again. So we have seen this massive sell-off over the last um, couple of months, couple of almost like a year now. And all these sell-offs happened after inflation upside surprises. Okay, so if we look at um, the inflation outlook, which has continued to be revised on the upside, that's what really has hurt fixed income assets. That's obviously what leads to a hiking cycle, but it's the inflation surprise which continued to harm us. So after the last inflation print in the States, um, inflation actually came down, um, but it came down less than expected. And there was also a problem with core inflation. But let me once again show you in detail. Okay, in order to show you, I'm going to go into um, one of our other tools and uh, we call it basically our global inflation monitor. So within this tool, we can actually keep a close track of what is happening with global inflation. And we're going to start with this inflation heat map. So you can see on the y axis all the different countries. And then on the x axis, you can see yeah, just the timeline, I guess. And then we've colored in the deviations from average inflation over that mean period. And basically in blue, you can see yeah, quite low or average inflation. And then in red, you can see how inflation picks up. And this speaks to the point we made in the beginning. It has become a very global phenomenon to have high inflation. And um, we could pick out any individual country here. But the point is really that inflation has surprised and continued to surprise on the upside. But let's once again look into the states a little bit more detailed. We're starting off by showing um, yeah, top line inflation. We often hear that the Federal Reserve looks through this. So let's look at top line inflation in the dark blue. You can see CPI inflation is coming down. So that's not too bad. PCE inflation, which we know the Fed is looking at um, more detailed, is coming down. And even PPI, so producer price inflation, is coming down sharply. I'm going to ignore the CPI PCE spread, which is wide, which also just means that inflation is going to come down more. So all of this is no problem. So inflation will come down. So where does the problem sit? The problem really sits, and I guess that's what spooked the market at the last inflation print is. If we look into core inflation, we have to look more detail. Let me switch off CPI and PCE spread. We look at core, basically PCE, probably arguably the most important metric for the Federal Reserve. It's also continuing coming down. We look at core PPI, so basically core producer price indices without core producer price inflation without energy and food also coming down. So where's the problem? The problem is really if we look at core CPI, that print which was released um, more recently, that really surprised on the upside. And most importantly, it's on the way up again. So we do expect core inflation to continue to come down from here. But the worry here really is that inflation stays higher for longer than what the market has actually anticipated. Thanks, Basti. High energy prices, high food prices, high inflation. So if I'm a listener right now, I'm asking, so where, where's, where's the good news? Yeah, I hear you. So it's hard to believe that we're still quite optimistic on fixed income assets across the board, on the bond space, on the income space, and we shall. And 
Henk are going to take you through that more detailed, but the answer is it always comes down to market pricing, right? And the reality is what we've seen already is already a massive repricing of fixed income and other asset classes. Okay, let me um, show you one of um, these themes which we have actually been featuring over the more recent past, where we basically say in the thematic approach, higher real interest rates in South Africa is something which really is standing out for us. And in order to look into this more detailed, we have to see what has actually repriced. And, 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 and the answer to that in all briefness is basically everything. So the best way for us to look at it is to, basic, to, to move into yeah, more like a global chart where we are showing the returns of individual asset classes on a calendar year basis. And it basically, st it basically starts by looking on the x-axis into the individual years and on the y-axis into the individual asset classes. All these returns are in local currency. So you can see in the blue we have positive returns on a set of asset classes and in red we have negative returns. If I now go into 2022 and what we've been through so far, you can see that we are looking into really, really a lot of red. So everything has basically repriced on the downside and nothing has worked, nothing is up. So it's quite tough um, in this environment to actually have positive returns. And the reality is most asset classes have not delivered. An asset class being down in itself doesn't really create value, but um, without stealing too much of Hank and Vishal Sander, just two final charts, one out of the cash and income space where we're just showing a three months Java in dark blue. Yes, it has moved up. And then one year NCDs in red, which have moved up much more. So we can see the spread between those two is basically close to an all time high, highlighting that in the cash and income space, taking term risk really pays and that we are in an extremely attractive environment um, for our income strategy. Okay, and I can take this also into the bond space where I quickly want to look into real interest rates in South Africa and the spread thereof against the United States. You can see that in South Africa, we're having a real interest rate differential against the United States of more than 8%. So that just means look at our 10-year government bond, it yields 11%. Look at the US government bond, it earns roughly four now, so that gives you a spread of 7%, but the real spread is above 8% because actually, as we speak, inflation in South Africa is much lower than in the United States. So you started touching on South Africa already, and I suppose let's touch on what the Reserve Bank is doing here in South Africa, and they seem to be reacting the same way as the Fed and what all the other central banks are doing. Is that the right way to be dealing with this situation? And is, can S, the South African economy be compared like for like with kind of the global economy and particularly the US? Yeah, that's what Andre, that's exactly the question we have to ask ourselves. And we do think um, and the answer to that is no, we cannot compare our economy to the United States. We cannot compare ourselves to the economy of the States where we've a lot of, um, yeah, we have just an incredibly strong labor market, strong demand in general. We do think inflation is more supply side driven. But uh, the demand is definitely there in the States, but in South Africa we have basically no demand, um, no economy which is pushing up inflation. So we cannot compare like for like, yet as you said, we have tried to keep up um, with the hiking cycle also to keep the rent at a decent level. Um, we're not going to succeed in this in the long term. So again, as said, the Fed is priced off the 375 basis point hikes for a fourth 75 basis point hikes hike and then for another 50 bips at the end of this year, I do not think that the SARP is going to be able to keep up at this pace um, on the back of the much, much weaker economy in South Africa. Okay. Well, thanks, Basti. Let's move on. Let's move on to Hink. Um, so you've heard what Basti's had to say. Higher infl inflation has resulted in central banks lifting interest rates to try and curb that inflation. Um, it's, the, re the reaction seems to be the same globally. Time will tell whether that's the right way to do things. In your kind of fund, you manage and you and your team manage the income, uh, prescient income provider. Kind of given these higher interest rates, what has been the effect on the fund? Kind of what are you, uh, what have you changed in the fund given what you're seeing that's happening now and some of the stuff that Basti's just raised? Yeah, good morning everyone. Thank you, Ray and my fellow pal panelists. Um, I mean, those are, the gr those are the questions we have to ask ourselves, right? And the sort of general misconception is that if interest rate gets moved higher, the whole term structure, the whole interest rate curve moves 
in similar fashion. But that's not the way it works in, in, in practice, right? So there's a lot priced in, as Basti has already alluded to. So if, if, if you think back to July, where our MPC moved 75 basis points, which was more than what the market expected, bond yields and interest rates along the term structure actually came down and we made money. Um, so we've seen a, quite a strong quarter for, for the income fund. Um, September a little bit softer with the surprise in the US inflation. But to be honest there, I mean, again, that print is lower than the peak. So we are seeing inflation coming down. It's just that core number that spooked the market a little bit. But you think back to the last 10 years, we've tried to get inflation up. Now it's up. Headlines are going. Now everyone wants to get it down again. We need to try and think about what's driving inflation. So we've touched on this throughout a number of our webinars before, but we've seen three supply chain shocks to the market. One, COVID, China zero COVID policy, and then the war, right? Plus on the demand side, we had COVID. So the way people bought things changed. If you work from home, I want a better TV. I'm not, I'm not taking transport, public transport, because I'm scared of COVID. I'm buying a second hand car. The ability to get the car to me and my ability to buy it has changed in the uh, fundamental fashion, and that's dr driven inflation higher. So we can explain why it's high. If we think about where inflation is going, we can see that the market, even in the US in the very short term, expects inflation next year this time to be below 3%, 2.7. Okay, that's a, l a long way from where we are now. So to reiterate what Bastian has said already, yes, we see high inflation. We understand why it's there. We understand what the market is pricing for it. And on the back of that, probably interest rates are being priced too aggressively. Okay. So let me show you what, what I've just said. Take the US curve and look at the SA context as well um, and see what the market is actually pricing and how that's already in the price and looking forward why we think there's a lot of value in that. Okay, first let's look at what the market is pricing in South Africa for interest rates and how that's changed over the last month. So very interestingly, again, post the surprise in the US inflation that was higher just on the core number, um, the market has now gone from pricing in not as many hikes to again pricing very aggressive hiking cycles. So um, that's a month ago, fairly flat. Yes, some more interest rate hikes coming and we can understand that when I show you the US curve. But that's where we are currently. So just to put it into context, if you think about sort of April next year, we're peaking at around 8.5% from about 7.5% um, a month ago. So that's another percent of hikes on top of the already very aggressive hiking price um, that we've seen. And we have seen the Saab hike already. So very aggressive, sort of very front-loaded hiking cycle um, in the SA context. Yes, this has shifted the curve a little bit on the back end as well. Um, but again, the, I think the sort of theme that we're trying to show, showcase and bring across is that there's a lot of negativity already in the price here. Okay, if we then compare this to the US, and this is where it gets very interesting for us. Um, so this, the red line on this chart is now the previous blue line I showed you. So basically what the market is expecting for our interest rates. And then that's just 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 the proposing the US curve on top of that. So again, aggressive front end, but where it's important is this sort of back end here where there's a bit of a divergence. So what this is telling us that as soon as this next year, August, the market is pricing the interest rates in the US to start coming down. Okay, so again, very aggressive hike now, and then a cutting cycle coming, um, where South Africa hasn't really gotten there yet, uh, still quite aggressive in, in pricing the hikes. Um, and as I've shown you, and as we've decided, or as we've explained, inflation is high, it's coming down, we know why it's high, um, and this sort of scenario around hike pricing of the hikes is probably a bit aggressive for us. Thanks, Singh. So what does that actually mean for your fund, the income provider? With all these changes in the fixed income environment, what have been the changes in the last quarter in the fund itself? It's an interesting question and a great one to ask. So the way we think about the income provider fund has always been around finding diverse sources of real return in the income space, using all those tools to get to a CPI plus number. And then very importantly, and we'll touch on this a little bit later, is the focus on risk management. So people in the income fund don't want to lose money. They say they understand the risk, but the moment you go down 0.1% in a month, the phones go off the hook here. Yeah. Um, we have to explain why. Okay, so that's very important to understand as a start. <clears throat> but what we have seen with the repricing and global interest rates, and specifically in SA as well, a lot of value, and I'll show that in a second, in the SA fixed income market. Bastian has showed us on the front end, the back end, etc. So the fund has migrated towards taking that exposure. There's just so much value in buying duration or fixed interest, rate, fixed interest risk um, in this context, and the fund has moved in that direction. So <clears throat> what we've seen, and as we've seen risk budget opening up, increasing the duration of the portfolio is very 
important for us and that's what we've done. Um, <clears throat> doing that is just not buying bonds at the back end saying this is the highest deal, let's do that. That's not what the income's there for. Okay, we want to think about what's my best total return bond and then put on top of that what's my best risk adjusted bond. And that's the way we've built the process of how to allocate to bonds in the income space. So biggest change in the portfolio has been moving away from floating rate credit. Uh, we, we're not particularly fond of credit at this point in time. We do think that there's not a lot of value relative to fixed bonds. <clears throat> so moving away from that, um, creating liquidity in the portfolio, taking it into some of the government bond exposure that we've seen and really take advantage of this value that we are um, trying to showcase today. Okay, so as I said, um, the yield we're buying the bonds at is not the only return that you're going to get from it. Because the curve is so steep, so front-end rates being a lot lower than back-end rates, there is what we call the roll-down, there's a pull-to-par effect. So if we add all of those things together, and just to show you, um, what is the total return you could expect from bonds across the curve if nothing changes over the next year? Okay, so what we're looking at over here is the different bonds on the curve, just government exposure, just to give you a sense of that, the different sort of drivers of the yield or the total return on the left here, and focus on the 2030s over here. So that's sort of the benchmark 10-year bond, eight years to go. You can expect 12.71% total return over the next year if nothing changes. Okay, so that's equity-like return if you think inflation around six, which is probably lower than that, that's inflation plus almost seven. So again, lots priced in already, shouldn't be too negative, a lot of value in going forward. Okay, so what, let's just say we're wrong here, okay, which we often are, and yields are 1% higher. Okay, 1% from where we are. Total return, most people would expect us to be down, but in reality, because we start with such a high yield, actually we're still doing cash plus one and a half, even if we're wrong with our view here going forward and his rates are 1% higher this time next year, okay? Look at these guys, almost 8% total return over the next year, okay? So the value case um, and what's priced in is obviously very evident from this. Okay, then just to jump into how do we allocate then two bonds in the income space, as I said, we look for total return and on the risk side, so the sharp ratio of some of these bonds, um, just to go to the summary, um, is this is sort of the allocation that we're trying to achieve in the income fund when we're buying bonds. So if we have a duration number, the duration number will be comp um, um, comp would comprise of these different bonds. So 2030s, as I've shown you, a lot of total return on that one, to 186, a little bit shorter, um, and then a little bit of the back-end bonds, just capturing that steepness um, and the roll in that part of the curve and then balancing it with some cash. So <clears throat> strong process when we're allocating to bonds, but biggest change in the portfolio, to answer the question, Ray, really has been this, seeing the value in the duration, seeing the curve shift in the way it does, and allocating to bonds in this way um, and making sure that the process works. Thanks, Inc. And, and I suppose income provider, very conservative fund. The, the mandate is not to lose cap capital over any rolling three months period. So during these uncertain times, how have you guys managed the fund in order to make sure that you kind of you meet that target of not losing clients money over a rolling three months period? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Ray. So if you think back to what I said about CPI plus three, that's sort of the return target. So the capital preservation comes with that and probably is more important. That's where we differentiate ourselves from some of the peers in the market. So Think back to right to the start. Why did we start this portfolio or this fund? We had a client, a beneficiary trust with widows and orphans. They needed something to give them regular income, so monthly income, but they didn't, they didn't have the stomach to have those drawdowns that the equity market or bond fund or bond market would give them. Um, and they needed that CPI plus target. So we started this portfolio. We said, we can find income assets for you. We can allocate towards them in a, a, a prudent way to not breach that risk target. Okay, so thinking about the risk target, we say we don't want to lose money over a rolling three-month period. That means that we have some risks to spend. It could be the last three months of return, but it could also be the next three months of yield that we've built into the portfolio. But in reality, it's a combination of those. So we need to think about one month, two months, one month forward, et cetera, um, and look at those numbers and take the most punitive one or the lowest one of those. And that's the amount of risk we can spend in the portfolio. So it's very important to understand how much risk I'm allowed to spend, what is the current context that I'm spending the risk in, and how much risk have I spent in the portfolio. So that's a lot of, a lot of words, but let me show you ex exactly how we do that and how we measure that in, in the portfolio itself to make sure we're very surgical on the way we take risk, specifically in an environment like we are now. It's, it is uncertain. It's the worst market for bonds in history. I mean, if you think about global bond returns year to date, it's 15% lower than the second worst year ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a ph phenomenal number. Um, but even in that time, we've been true to our, our nature. We haven't breached our risk target. Um, and let me show you how we do that. 
So just to show you the, the, the end of the whole process, so as, as I said, we've got a three month number, that means there's some risk we can spend, there's some risk that we can take. Um, so we allocate risk to the portfolio from an instrument level, so these are the different instruments we can buy. We categorize them in asset allocation that you guys would be very familiar with, so the different things we can buy, fixed rate bonds, floating bonds, inflation bonds, etc. And then we allocate each of those to a risk category. Okay, so let's jump to the end just to give you a sense <clears throat> on, the, on the three month basis, how much risk are we taking and how much risk can we take? Okay, so if you give me a second just to switch off all these building blocks that we have, and look at the current fund, the current risk we're taking, and the current risk we are allowed to take. Um, and it should give you a very good sense of how surgical we are when we do this. So firstly, very important thing to see, so this is rolling three month return numbers expected uh, in the portfolio, and you can see it's distributed to the right of the zero line, which one tells us that the way we've built the portfolio is better than the sum, uh, better than the parts. So the sum is better than the parts, and that's the first step that's very good to see for us. Then we've said, okay, how much risk do we have? These are the black lines. So on a 99% confidence, the worst three months given the current fund has been about a percent or just 0.9, 99.5, a little bit more than a percent, and then 99.9% .9 of the time, the worst case would have been 2%. And these red lines are what we can spend. So how much budget do we have? And you can see these are dynamic and we always measure the risk and manage the risk according to these to make sure that we don't jeopardize and put at risk our risk target over a rolling three month period. That makes a lot of sense and it's, I see the funds actually done really well over the last 12 months. Can you take us through what have been the drivers of that performance and kind of what do you see going forward being the drivers of performance for the fund? Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so it's interesting to think about, so people often ask us why not more duration and that's exactly the answer there. We don't have risk budget to spend on duration or taking active risk in the portfolio then we won't do it. Why? Because that capital preservation is more important than hitting that CPI plus three. Um, people don't want to lose money. If you compound those positive returns, positive returns, you actually then outperform over the long run and that's the, that's the objective of the income fund. Um, so looking at the drivers over the last year, as I said right at the start, we are always trying to find diverse sources of real return. You don't want to be a one-trick pony in this space. If you think back to 2010, heavy credit funds lost 10% for the year. They're gone. 2017, guys with heavy property, first quarter 2017, property lost 40%, 50%. Those guys are not here anymore. We want to be here for the next 23 years with the same recipe. Okay, so the, it's always important to find different drivers of real return, and that's certainly what happened over the last year. Yes, we like duration, we've added the active risk there, but we've also had different building blocks. Preference shares has been a good example. We do have some good um, yielding floating rate instruments in the portfolio. The offshore allocation always helps us. So there's opportunities to find those and diversify away from one single asset class and then contribute those through time uh, to get to our positive real return. Um, but let me not say that, let me show you the, the actual building blocks over the last one year and what has driven return for this time. Perfect. So what we're looking at here is just over the last year, so August the last year to August this year, the monthly return broken up in the different bar charts and then each little block being the sort of driver of return for that month. And what's very interesting to see is that there's obviously a lot of the colors going on here, so that tells us there's a lot of different drivers of real return. That's what we're trying to achieve here. But more interestingly, if you <clears throat> think about the duration, as I said, we all like the duration. We think that's where the value is. It adds a bit of volatility, but it, over the year it's uh, added to the performance positively. Um, but <clears throat> just if you contrast that to the preference shares, Again, where months where we've seen negative returns from the bonds, the preference shares come through and aid the portfolio, gives us that buffer, um, <clears throat> make sure we get that positive return on a, on a shorter term basis. If we add up all of these up through one year, they all contribute positively, which is also a good story to tell. Um, but the key thing here is that we have diverse drivers of real return in the portfolio. Okay, so diverse drivers of real return, be surgical when you think about risk specifically in the current context um, and really make sure that we deliver on the recipe going forward and give the clients what they expect and what they've come to know and appraise and income provided to be. Thanks, Inc. Vishal, let's turn to you. So you've heard the gents talk about these developments in the global macros kind of landscape. Can you start off by just sharing with us how that has affected South African bonds uh, specifically? Sure. Morning, everyone. So thanks, Ray, and thanks, Bastian, for describing the key uh, macroeconomic considerations earlier. So, um, yeah, so it's been a long-term contention that um, South African bond yields have been mainly um, globally, global in nature. And what I mean by this is that 
since uh, unconventional policy toolkits have been used um, post the global um, finance crisis of 2008 in aggregate will inform whether your, um, they are supportive of risky assets or not, right? So over the past year, um, it's been quite a sort of enormously risk-off risk um, environment. And we've seen with that uh, risky assets across the board have been, have had suffered significant drawdowns. Um, coming to SA, so SA bonds haven't actually done too badly. If you look at the all bond return index, they've only been down about just under 1% versus something like the, on your currency side of, side, side of things, the RAN has been down by about 13% and your equities have been down by about 10%. Coming back to financial conditions, right? So at the epicenter of financial conditions sits um, monetary policy normalization of key central banks. And in particular, the, and probably most consequential will be that of the United States. So now the key issue that uh, financial markets face is that um, they need to cor correctly um, predict the trajectory that which federal fund rates will go towards to restore uh, price instability and consequently um, the knock-on effects that that will have on the US real economy. So I mean the main challenge in terms of predicting this trajectory that federal fund rates will take is basically that may, the main um, inflation dynamics that US, the price and pressure is coming from is your that the US, the US so it's, the risk is exogenously supply side driven. And as a result, the market has little evidence in the way of printing inflation that, um, that rate hikes are actually taken into action and, have, and are actually so being successful at all. And as a result, this creates a negative feedback loop where further um, sort of aggressive front loaded hikes are being priced in. And this is precisely the environment that SA bonds have been experiencing over the past year. So it, it does sound like it's quite an uncertain environment to be managing bonds. And if I think about your, your team and how you guys manage the Flexible Bond Fund, is, does this mean from, a, from our perspective that you're looking then to kind of, with all the uncertainty and how all the information that everyone's looking at in terms of when does the Fed increase um, rates, where, at what point, when is the inflection point, when, do kind of, when does inflation start coming down? The people listening will probably start assuming then that you are managing your fund quite conservatively and probably looking at some a, a, a kind of low duration in the fund. Would that be a fair assumption? Not quite, Ray, right? So, well, it's absolutely true that we're seeing unprecedented, unprecedented amounts of uncertainty currently in the market. This does not naturally um, mean that we have a low risk duration stance in our portfolios, right? So, I mean, that sort of natural knee jerk. And behavioral stance is precisely what most market market participants will assume but our investment process sort of tries to eliminate that exact emotive decision making so what we try and do at the end of the day is that our portfolio stance is determined by uh, a systematic scoring methodology which basically tries to identify uh, objective and quanti quantifiable ways of determining two factors of bond returns now once we have this these true determinants it's quite easy then to navigate your, the way forward in terms of uh, this environment. And we simply ask ourselves the question, right? Given the factors that are sort of most, most important, what has actually changed, right? So I'll, I'll take us to the portal in a second here, but if you look at the dynamics right there, so South African bonds in terms of have screamed quite positively when it comes to rail heels. However, on, on, we know that um, economic um, growth um, globally has been stuttering, however it hasn't completely capitulated and fallen off a cliff yet. We also know that financial conditions, while initially were tightening at the beginning of the year, have sort of not gotten to a completely um, stage where they are um, completely economically constricting at levels, right? All these factors combined uh, and are measured, are measured in a systematic way to sort of arrive at a score which suggests to us that we should hold a moderate overweight stance in our portfolio. So yeah, I mean, as most of you will probably be aware, this is our portal. And as I mentioned earlier, right, there are four main pillars which feed into our bond score. Firstly, that being valuations, economics, financial conditions, and sentiment. I won't drill down into the sub-factors quite yet, but, uh, but what we can clearly see is that valuations scream positively right now, along with financial conditions, as mentioned, and economics and, and your sentiment scores are not that great, 
all of this combines to op obtain a moderate overweight score, um, which is the stance at which we apply to our portfolios right now. Okay, so, so let's talk about that. So duration is basically the measure of fixed rate risk and, and it, it, as shown by the sensitivity of, you know, the sensitivity interest rate movements up and down, right? Which is very important and very relevant right now. And the longer you are, the higher the duration and the shorter you are, the lower the duration. So in your case, you're saying you're moderately overweight. Where would that put you in terms of the curve itself? If you're trying to explain that to, to clients in terms of how are they positioned in the fund currently, given what we're talking about now, and also given that we don't know where interest rates are going up or down and also where inflation is and when we expect inflation to come down. That's a great question, Ray. So yeah, so currently we position at the very back end of the yield curve, where in particular we invested in 2048s, right? Um, this might sound contradictory to having a moderate overweight stance, but bear with me for a second. So one of the benefits of having a quantitative and systematic framework is that it lends itself naturally to empirical testing. And what we're able to do is that we're able to determine what is the likely change in the yield curve over the next 12 months based on a particular score. When I say score, I mean a set of key determinants, which I spoke to earlier, which is valuations, um, economic sentiment, and uh, financial conditions, right? Once we know what the score is, for a given um, score based on some past results we have, we're able to then easily determine what the yield curve will do over the next 12 months. And it has result 2048 scream um, favorably in this case, and hence the reason why we, we invest in these right now. So yeah, the following chart is uh, the performance of 2048s versus that of the 35s. On your x-axis, we have the shift in the yield curve, where a negative number um, represents a, con a contraction in the yield curve, and a positive number means a sell-off or a rise in the yield curve. On your y-axis, we have uh, returns, right? Now, superimposed in the background is the probability distribution. And if you look really closely, you'll see that majority of the probability distribution sits towards a, a re reduction in, re in rates in the yield curve. Um, and by, if you look at the bars, you can clearly see a sort of asymmetric um, difference in the performance of the various bonds, right? So if you look at the shift in the yield curve, a lower by about 3%, we can see that your 48 outperforms your 35 by about six, five to six basis points, excuse me, percent. And if you look at the other end of the yield curve, if the, the yield curve has a shift higher, your 48 only under, underperforms the 35 by about 3%, 3, 3%, excuse me. What this implies shows is the asymmetric nature of returns of your 48s or, and your 35s. And this is the precise um, dynamic that we try to get, take advantage of um, currently. Thanks, Michelle. You seem quite confident there. So the fund aims to beat uh, all nominal bonds, all inflation-linked bonds in cash over any rolling three-year period. Has the fund done that? Yes, it has, right? So over the over rolling three-year period, we've outperformed the inflation bond index, your nominal bond index, and cash. However, during over short time periods, sort of we, we do lag the, the performance a little bit. But um, we have this is a high conviction fund, and we sort of try to out, if you sort of invest with us in the long term, you'll bear the fruits of positive returns. Okay, so we've touched on quite a lot today in terms of um, Basti touching on the macro. Landscape, um, Hink touching on the income provider, and Vishal touching on the flexible bond fund, and kind of how all of this has been affected by global changes and also kind of the reaction of our own reserve bank. Now, before I get to questions, I thought I'd give you all an opportunity to just maybe give us an outlook for, uh, in terms of South African bonds and, and flexible bond income provider, and then Basti, if you could just also give us a macro outlook as well. Because what can, there's been a lot going on, and for the person listening, like what, do you, what do you make of all of this and kind of what should they be expecting going forward? Michelle, if I can start with you. So we're trying to take advantage of the two key attributes of bond, which is receiving the contractual coupon payment and also the, the bond price convert, converging to its par value, right? Um, high yields that we have right now means that we're able to reinvest coupons at, at a high level. And this is quite attractive because the total return that you can see from bonds um, can be higher than the yield that which these bonds were initially issued at. This dynamic is precisely what we've been taking advantage of over the past um, while, and we continue to look for other opportunities across the yield curve to exploit. Okay, so where there's risk, there's opportunity. Um, Hink, 
Yeah, so I think uh, Vissal very eloquently uh, uh, sort of mentioned our systematic way of doing things. There's obviously a lot of uncertainty, a lot of noise. Um, don't read the headlines, it's going to confuse you. Um, follow a manager that's got a systematic process and philosophy that cuts through that noise. That's exactly what we do on the income side of things. Obviously, risk focused in a time of uncertainty is very important. We've show, showcased it through this period that we haven't breached our risk target in as arguably the worst case, or worst case environment for fixed income. Uh, focus on real returns, compounding those positively. If you think about the fund, lots of forward yield pricing around 9.5% currently for 1.6 year duration. Great sweet spot for us. Um, yeah, we look forward to a solid 12 months going forward, given what's already priced. Yeah, that's great. I mean, the, your systematic approach kind of makes you stay within that risk budget of yours and hence the outcomes that you get. Um, Basti. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with everything which has been said already. I guess, again, especially in this environment, we are able to cut out the emotion, follow a systematic approach and make sure that we go with the evidence. And I mean, we've shown it in the beginning of the presentation that the evidence is there that the hiking cycle itself is not necessarily a problem for fixed income markets. And actually, to the point, I mean, we're looking at two funds, um, the one fund yielding more than 11% now, the other one yielding more than nine with almost no duration, a very limited duration. So um, rates going higher is always painful for fixed income investments, but rates being high is very attractive for the time ahead. So. Yeah, we just, um, as a systematic house, um, suggest strongly cut through the noise, um, cut out the noise, and um, yeah, look into the longer term because um, the starting point for both of these strategies which we've discussed right now is very, very attractive. Okay, so rising interest rates can be quite painful in the short term, but only in the short term, and higher interest rates will be baked into the performance of the fund going forward, which is great. Let us look at any questions from the audience before we close uh, for the morning. Morning. We're going to take the questions live, um, and there's quite a few coming in, so thank you very much for sending them through, and please continue to send them through. I've got quite a few, and I, I thought I'd start with you, Vishal. Um, there's a question that comes in that says, given all the noise around inflation, what is your view on inflation, um, and is there any uh, room for inflation-linked bonds in the flexible bond fund? Sure. Thanks, Ray. So yeah, so currently we, um, yeah, so flexible bonds are allowed to hold inflation in bonds. However, currently we don't hold them. Um, so the inflation compensation right now that nominal bonds offer relative to inflation in bonds is at a, sort of a, a higher rate of hit level and hence we don't hold them at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, question that's coming for you, Basti, from Dean. He says, do you believe there's any structural changes to global capital markets and that you had a you have to adapt in the management of the funds? Yeah, that's a good question because first of all, yes, uh, thanks Dean for that question. Uh, definitely there's, there's always structural changes and I guess we have to always adapt um, in such a fast moving environment which we operate in. Um, what could be potential structural shifts? Um, I guess uh, there are some, and I mean, we spoke a lot about inflation. This is a fixed interest webinar. So I thought to bring up some structural um, shifts on inflation. Um, it's a lot of talk about uh, inflation has been so low over the last years because of um, cheap labor supply, um, which might be falling away, the ability to use China in your supply chain, which because of geopolitical tensions might fall away, the ability to use uh, cheap oil or low energy prices, which might be falling away. So there's a lot of structural forces to bring inflation up and we have to acknowledge that. But to be honest, there's also a lot of structural forces in place uh, to continue to bring inflation down. So I'll give you an example of that. More inequality, demographical issues, all of that hasn't changed. So these deflationary issues which pushed inflation so low over the last 30 years, to be honest, they're not gone at all. So uh, we will expect um, those to continue to push inflation lower, no structural shift there. And what we also have to acknowledge, um, we also have positive structural shifts. Um, for example, the massive rise in productivity, which we can measure. So we all work smarter post COVID. Um, we are more flexible in terms of our workspace. There have been made so many gains in terms of productivity and that is um, positive for growth, but actually deflationary. So yes, surely structural shifts. Uh, we don't see a need to directly adapt our strategies. We think our strategies are dynamic enough to, to cater for uh, these structural shifts, but there's a, there's a need to be um, on the lookout here. So it's a very good question to be honest. Okay, and if we, if we stay on inflation, um, so we know the US is coming out later today with the latest inflation numbers and everyone's starting to get jittery, you know, every time this comes around, 
what is the market expecting and what are you guys thinking? Yeah, but we must say now we're running a systematic process, so we're not jittery at all. But the reality is we obviously also look these numbers closely and are um, hoping that they work out in our direction. So the expectations are for 8.1% at um, top line inflation today after 8.3 print um, the last time. So inflation is coming down, but really see 8.1 instead of 8.3 the last time. It's frustratingly low the pace at which it's coming down. So there might be a little bit of room um, that uh, this might be seen as disappointing. We must obviously see the decomposition of inflation, um, which we've shown earlier in, in, in the video. That's obviously actually key. And if I look into that, you can see that we had a 6.3% um, core inflation print. And we know the Fed looks more at core inflation. We had a 6.3% core inflation print, um, the last uh, inflation release, and that was an uptick. And for today, we're expecting 6.5. So it's another uptick. So that's really, really worrying us. So that's uh, where the issue sits. Having said that, um, if you look at the bigger picture, if you look at the trend inflation, it's coming down and we don't think that will change. And um, yeah, maybe it's time of the negative and negative upside surprise months on months on months. Uh, maybe it's the time for a downside surprise here. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Basti. It's quite a long question here on Bank of England. So I'm gonna try and summarize, but basically lots of headlines in the UK about uh, Bank of England intervening to kind of save the financial system in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, is there a risk? What's the impact for the rest of the world in South Africa? And is there kind of a contagion risk? Uh, around this. Is that to me? Yeah, yeah. You morning. Get, yeah. Cool. morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so that's also in, always an interesting one. And um, if you think about the way banks work, they get 10 Rand in and they lend out 100 Rand. And for that risk they're taking, there's uh, certain regulatory requirements on the capital side that they need to hold. Um, so what's happened on the UK side is that banks hold uh, 30 or 40 year bonds or guilds, as they call them in the UK. Uh, those have obviously spiked up with the, a lot of noise around tax cuts and uh, sort of spending stuff on the on the fiscal side. Um, and that's hurt the capital side of the bank uh, to the point where what banks and pension funds are pretty close to being on the brink. Um, and the BOE needed, has needed to step in and create liquidity again uh, in that market, trying to get yields down uh, and restore that sort of capital um, integrity of the bank. So um, that's more or less what's playing out. Yes. Um, it, it creates more uncertainty for us, and it's another sort of uh, uh, addition to the volatility that we've already seen. Should we be worried from a contagion risk perspective, apart from the risk of nature of the, these sort of events? Not necessarily. Um, I mean, obviously, something to always look out for. We don't have a lot of exposure from an SA banking or financial market perspective off, uh, to, to those banks, um, but certainly something to watch out for. Uh, the noise is, is, is warranted, uh, but for now, we, we, we think it's all, it should be okay. Okay, and if I... There's a question here from Gustav. What would be the impact of grey listing um, on on on? Yeah, that's a it's it's a topical question. And thanks for that question. And I'll, I'm, I'll jump in and, and answer that. Um, we've done a number of uh, sort of uh, sort of we've done a work on this and try to look at countries that's previously been uh, grey listed and try to see is there an impact one on the way that trade flows, is the sort of money flows between the countries, and as well on on the GDP side of things. And there's absolutely no evidence to show that if you get gray lists as one, it's bad for you, or two, it's good for you. So um, the, the, the evidence goes in both directions. Uh, are we getting, going to get gray listed? Uh, uh, maybe not. Um, so the way that the, the body that uh, put us on watch works is they want to see progress. And we've set up a lot of strong um, committees, working streams in, in national treasury across the markets to try and uh, show the progress. We certainly has there has been a lot of progress. Um, and if you think about where, where the impact would be most, it's probably our banks and the the, the report on the grey listing actually uh, applauds our banks for how well um, they have been doing in terms of compliance around uh, sort of the money laundering and regulatory stuff. So um, our view, probably a, a bit of a storm in a teacup, uh, probably not going to get grey listed and we shouldn't see too much of an impact. Um, it might be a bit of a strong view or contrarian view, um, but we shouldn't expect too much of market volatility from this. Cool, thank you. Thanks, Hink. And then, Basti, back to you. There's a question here on... Um... I suppose we're touching on how the rest of the world affects South Africa. And you said earlier that uh, how we, the NPC, South African NPC and Reserve Bank kind of follows the Fed in terms of hiking. Um, and you mentioned something about protecting the RAND. And there's a question here asking you to explain what would happen to the RAND if we didn't follow the Fed. Yeah, that's a good question. We spoke about it earlier in the webinar that um, we are hiking quite a bit because we are following um the fed and we think it's true and we think it's we our view is that it's not necessary to the full extent 
the right thing to do because we must differentiate between economies. The economy in the States is just very strong, very super strong labor market. And in South Africa, we're at the other end of the spectrum. So we can't just blindly follow the Fed. And that we've got a strong view of that. And that's also reflective in our funds. We spoke about income provider benefiting from the term risk um, taking duration. We spoke about flexible bonds taking term risk on the bond side because we expect uh, the SOP to eventually back off but having said all of this, while this is our view, I actually also want to have some sympathy with the SARP here. So we don't have to look too far. Um, we can all sound smart and tell them why they're doing the wrong thing and why they shouldn't be hiking while the states are hiking. But I mean, look into the UK, what's happening if you stop hiking and if you run a contrarian monetary policy. Okay, it is difficult. So they are obviously worried about this. And we must also bear in mind that the SARP long-term has done a world-class job in terms of securing price stability. And long-term price stability, securing price stability is really what we need in South Africa. And they are continuing to secure that. So. We think they should stop hiking, but there is a level of sympathy for what they are doing. And we have to acknowledge the bigger picture here as well, which is price stability is super important for South Africa. Okay, and then last question I've got here for you, Hink. Um, what's the outlook for income provider fund and what, what is the current forward yield looking like? Yeah, as mentioned earlier, a forward yield around nine and a half, so 9.44 as we speak. Um, and I think what we've tried to showcase and uh, bring across across everything we've said is that a lot of negativity pricing to the markets, a lot of forward yield pricing to the fund, um, and we really do think that that's going to play out. So um, we've done some work around looking at sort of forecasted forward yield in the portfolio and what does that mean for the return subsequent, uh, and it's, it's got a very strong um, sort of correlation and it's a very good indicator of what, what could happen from a return perspective. So we are, as Bastian said, very uh, sort of bullish on the portfolio. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, sort of positive uh, returns expected going forward. Perfect. Thanks, Inc. And with that, that brings an end to our uh, interest-bearing webinar. And I'd like to thank everyone who's taken the time to listen to us. Um, and also just thank you for trusting us. Thank you for trusting us with your and your clients' blood, sweat, and tears.